In today's lesson, we are going to revise our biology form 4 syllabus. Let's go! What is up guys? Welcome back to the channel. With SPM around the corner, I'm sure biology students, you guys are feeling a bit nervous. Therefore, today I decide to do a revision on your whole biology syllabus. This video will be divided into two parts, part 1 being the form 4 one and part 2 being the form 5 one. Before I start this video, go to the links in the description and download this PDF. It will be provided for you free with absolutely no extra charge. Without further ado, let's begin. Let's begin with your mitochondria and chloroplast. One quick way to memorize your mitochondria and chloroplast is that their processes complement each other. Okay, so what do I mean? Mitochondria and chloroplast, they will sort of do like an exchange, all right? Mitochondria will do respiration. As you know, respiration will take oxygen and glucose and then they will convert into carbon dioxide and water and pass it to chloroplast. Chloroplast will carry out photosynthesis, which is the reverse. They will use carbon dioxide and water, getting the energy from sunlight, and they will convert these raw ingredients into oxygen and glucose. So we get the energy out from the other end. We use this energy for growth, reproduction, mitosis, and so on. How about the other five? Let's talk about protein synthesis. Protein synthesis is the production of protein. Your body is full of protein. Your hair is protein. Your enzyme is protein. To make protein, you need these five components, or I like to call it the t-shirt making story. What do I mean? Just imagine it this way, protein being your t-shirt. So how do you produce t-shirt in a factory? First and foremost, you need your boss. That is your nucleus. So the boss will give out instructions and they'll give it to who? They will give it to the ribosome or I like to call it the sewing machine. Your ribosome is to combine all the amino acid together. You can think of amino acid sort of like a thread. Okay, like a benang. So they will combine all this thread into a t-shirt and then they will put it onto a conveyor belt. You know, your sushi belt. Okay, the conveyor belt in the factory. This conveyor belt is our rough ER, all right? So this rough ER will carry the t-shirt and then they will give it to Golgi apparatus. Before you start selling the t-shirt, you need to put branding on it, you need to modify it, and so on. So Golgi apparatus job is to package and modify the protein, and when they pack it into a plastic, the bag is what we call vesicle. So now your protein, which is the t-shirt, is complete and it's ready to sell. So there, this simple t-shirt making process, you can get five organelles memorized there. Plus with the other two, mitochondria and chloroplast, you have seven there. So what are the remaining ones? Okay, you have your smooth ER, which is almost the same as a rough ER, which is to synthesize fats and lipids. Alright, so the seven organelles I highlighted here are the most important ones in the exam. Moving on, I'm sure you know this in your form one already, the difference between animal cell and plant cell, fixed shape, of course animal cells they don't have fixed shape because animal cells do not have cell wall. Alright, plant cells having cell wall, that's why they have fixed shape. Okay, this is related to the next point. Alright, animal cells have no cell wall, plant cells have cell wall, vacuole, animal cells no vacuole, plant cells have vacuole, chloroplast, no and yes, centriol, this is not really important, so yes and no. Food storage, we animal cells, we store our sugar as glycogen in your muscles, whereas plant cells, they will store it as starch, just like your potato. Adaptations of organelles, very common sense stuff. They will ask you what cells have a lot of what organelles. So who has a lot of mitochondria? So mitochondria is to provide energy in the form of ATP. Any cells that need ATP has a lot of mitochondria. 
So muscle cells, sperm cells, okay, muscle cells you need it, they need mitochondria for movement. Sperm cell, pretty much the same thing for the movement or the synthesis of ATP. Remember, always say synthesis of ATP. Do not ignore the word ATP because that's your keyword in scoring. Next, ribosome, rough ER and Golgi apparatus, as we know, this is the t-shirt making machine. T-shirt being the protein. So any cells that synthesize protein needs a lot of these three. So for example, your liver cells and a pancreatic cell because they produce enzymes. Therefore, you have making enzyme, which is a form of protein. Next, chloroplast, you have this in your palisade mesophyll. I'm sure you know what is this. The layer right beneath the upper epidermis of the cell, which is the main site for photosynthesis. Moving on. All right, this paramecium and amoeba part, I wouldn't want you to focus, just sort of like touch and go. You only need to memorize a few keywords for these two microorganisms. So amoeba, they will do binary fission or spore formation, depending on the condition of their surrounding. They will do phagocytosis. This is the eating, swallowing part of any small organisms. Even our white blood cells, they do that. Next, pseudopodia. Pseudo being fake, podia means leg. So pseudopodia is the fake leg. What do I mean? If I were to engulf, engulf means eat. If I were to engulf a food particle, so I would extend my cell to form a leg before closing them down and surrounding them. That is what we call the pseudopodia. Pseudopodia is a bit related to your phagocytosis. Not only that, your pseudopodia is also involved in movement. All right, so your pseudopodia has two functions. And then moving on to paramecium. Um, paramecium, they will do binary fission or conjugation. Conjugation is the sexual reproduction of a microorganism. Cilia means they have hair. And paramecium and amoeba, they share these two, means they have contractile vacuole. What is contractile vacuole? Think of contractile vacuole like the kidney for both of them, okay? They will do something called osmoregulation, which means to control water content inside them. Next, simple diffusion. All their processes, no matter gases or salt or food particles, simple diffusion is enough for them to survive because they are unicellular organisms. They don't need any specific organ for transport. Let's look at cell specialization. What is cell specialization? It's the adaptation of a cell to have special structure or function. Meaning that turning a stem cell, which is an original cell, into a specialized cell. For example, when you are an embryo, you have a ball of cells. These cells, they have no function. And as you grow up, all these cells, they will start to specialize. They will start dividing themselves into groups into muscle cells, into nerve cells, into skin cells, and so on. Let's look at humans first, all right? So cell, you have epithelial cell, which is your skin cell, you have red blood cell, white blood cell, nerve cell, muscle cell, and sperm cell, or ovum. This, you have really learned it in form one. Next, you have your tissue. I will put more attention in your tissue because this is the most tricky part that they will ask. You have your epithelial tissue, which is the thing that surrounds okay, your cheek cell is your epithelial tissue. The skin inside you and your organs, those are epithelial tissue. Next, muscle tissue, you have three types. You have smooth, skeletal, and cardiac. Smooth is the involuntary muscle, things that you cannot control. For example, your esophagus, for example, your stomach. Okay, these are made of smooth muscle. Skeletal muscles are muscles that are voluntary, muscles that you can move, for example, your bicep, your tricep, your antagonistic muscles. Cardiac muscle, you have only one place that has cardiac muscle, that is your heart. All right. So if your heart fails, there is no muscles that can replace them unless you get a heart transplant. Moving on, connective tissue, this is what I call the weird class because you have bone, adipose being your fat tissue okay, underneath your skin. Your cartilage, which is the soft bone, okay, your ear is made of cartilage, and of course your blood. How are they connective tissue? I don't know. They sort of connect things, I guess. That's why I call this the weird family. Next, moving on, you have your organs. I don't think I need to go too much into this. Your skin, stomach, heart, liver, and kidney, you know this. 
and then your system you have 11 system which you have again learn it in form one you just need to remember one function for each system I, and i think you have no problem doing so because i believe you have almost learned all the systems all right integumentary system is your skin you learn your muscular system which is in your form five your antagonistic muscles you learn your circulatory system which is in your form five again your skeletal system, your nervous system, you learn in form 5 also, lymphatic system, form 5 again, endocrine system, form 5 again, digestive system, we will go into that later, respiratory system, same thing, go to that later, excretory system, and reproductive system, okay? I'm sure you have learned more than half of these, so I'm sure you have no problems in their functions. Moving on, let's go into plants. Plant is a bit more simpler, and I don't really like to talk much about plants because they are not very common in your exam. So, you have your cell, uh, you have your epidermal cell, xylem, phloem, and gut cell. I'm sure you recognize most of them. And then tissue. Um, for plants, you have two types of tissue. You have meristematic tissue, meaning the growing tissue, I like to call it. Permanent tissue being the mature tissue means they won't grow anymore. So let's look at our meristematic tissue. You only have two tissue here, which is your root tip and your shoot tip. Or I like to call it the apical meristem and of course the lateral meristem at the root tip and the shoot tip. Moving on, you have your permanent tissue. Permanent tissue, you have three types here. You have your epidermal tissue, the skin of the plant. Vascular tissue, the blood vessel of the plant. Not really the blood vessel, but the vessel. And of course the ground tissue, which is the meat of the flesh or the muscle of the plant. For support purpose, obviously. Right, so epidermal tissue, you have your cuticle, which is the waxy layer, your root hair, which is uh, inside your root, to absorb water and mineral salt, and of course your gut cells, which is to control your stomata. Vascular tissue, this is really simple, your xylem and your phloem, xylem to absorb water, phloem to absorb sucrose and organic substance. Ground tissue, you have your parenchyma, which is the young tissue, you get these in young veggies when you eat veggie which is very chewy they are full of parenchyma cell colenchyma is the older cell when you eat very old vegetable when they are very hard okay, these are old cells and of course sclerenchyma you can't eat these because these are wood okay kayu you cannot eat kayu isn't it okay because that's very old it's sclerenchyma all right so yeah young old and very old moving on organ very simple you only have flower leaf roots and of course system, you only have the root and the shoot system. Really, really simple stuff, okay? Again, like your human, focus more on the tissue part. Moving on, let's go into chapter three, which is your plasma membrane. There are two keywords I want you to memorize here. Number one being semi-permeable. Semi-permeable means they only allow certain substance to pass through. Next, that would be your fluid mosaic model. Fluid means the membrane is not rigid, means they are not stiff. They are made of phospholipid and protein and they are free to move sideways. Mosaic means if you look at the top, it is like tiles. You know what is tile? Your tiles on your floor, when the phospholipid and the protein, they are arranged together, they sort of look like mosaic. So we call them mosaic model. Phospholipid and protein forms a mosaic pattern. Questions like these usually carry two marks. One mark for the fluid, one mark for the mosaic. Next, make sure you know how to label them. I know this is very simple, but still, you have your phospholipid by layer. If they are pointing to both layer, make sure you are saying phospholipid by layer, by being two. If they are only asking for one, this thing is called your phospholipid. No by layer, because there's no two layers here. You have your hydrophilic head, which means they love water, and you have the hydrophobic tail, means they are scared of water. Next, you have all these tiny, tiny particles here. We call it cholesterol. Basically, cholesterol is to stabilize your plasma membrane. Uh, you have your carbohydrate chain here. If this carbohydrate chain is attached to your phospholipid, we call it glycolipid. Glyco being sugar, okay? Because this is a carbohydrate chain, and if it is attached to a protein. We call it a glycoprotein, very straightforward stuff. And of course, you have your carrier protein, you have your pore protein. Let's do a quick summary on all the transport. You have your simple diffusion, osmosis, and your facilitated diffusion. 
These three are under passive transport. Passive transport means they don't need ATP and they are going down the concentration gradient. Means they will go from high concentration to low concentration. So you have your simple diffusion. So who can do simple diffusion? Either they are small or they are non-polar. What does it mean by non-polar? Means they have no charge. Okay, as you can see here, all the fatty substance, fatty acid, glycerol, and ardate. Remember ardate being very fat, which is a vitamin A, D, E, K. And small substance like water, uh, carbon dioxide and oxygen, they can straight away pass through via simple diffusion. But for water, we can only use one word for water, that is osmosis. I'm sure you know this. And of course, facilitated diffusion are for substances that are large, and of course, if they are polar, means if they have charge. For example, potassium and sodium ion, you see they have a charge here. And of course, amino acid and glucose, they are very big compared to, of course, oxygen and carbon dioxide. Therefore, they need your carrier protein or your pore protein to help them go through. If active transport, this is very simple. Active transport means the opposite of passive transport, means they need ATP. And of course, they are going against the concentration gradient. Means they are going from a low concentration to a high concentration area. They are going against the gradient. That's why they need energy. Moving on, if you put your red blood cell into hypotonic, what is hypotonic again? Hypotonic means a very watery surrounding. Remember, when we are talking about hypo, iso, and hypertonic, we are talking about the solution, not the cell, the solution surrounding it. If you are putting into hypo, means it is less concentrated than the cell. Water is moving into the cell. That's why you get hemolysis. Lysis means burst. Hemo because red blood cell has hemoglobin. Iso means same. Water moving in and out at the same rate. Hyper means it is very salty outside. Water will move out. So your red blood cell will do cremation, which means they will shrink. Next, let's look at chapter 4. Um, the first part being the importance of water. I know this is not a very important part. You just need to memorize two or three functions of water. They are a solvent, universal solvent, or you can say they are a medium for biochemical reaction or transport. Maintain your body temperature for support. This is in plants. Lubrication for your joints. And of course, provide moisture. Next, let's look at the first class first. That would be your carbohydrate. Carbohydrate has three, which is the simple sugar, monosaccharide, mono means one. You have glucose, fructose, and galactose here. Okay, they are reducing sugar, which means if you do a Benedict test on them, you will get a positive result. Positive result being your break rate precipitate. Next, you have your disaccharide, di means two, be, that being your maltose, sucrose, and lactose. They are all reducing sugar. They will also show positive. Benedict result besides your sucrose. Sucrose is not a reducing sugar. Therefore, if you do Benedict test on your sucrose, your Benedict solution is going to remain blue. If you want your Benedict solution to show result, you are going to put dilute hydrochloric acid to it because dilute hydrochloric acid will chop this sucrose into fructose and glucose. Okay, so moving on, let's talk about how do you change monosaccharides into disaccharides. When you combine glucose and glucose, you get maltose and water. This forward reaction, we call it condensation. Why condensation? Because water is coming out. Very simple. Glucose and fructose, you get sucrose and water. Okay, Fructose and sucrose, you get these from fruits. Your sugar cane has a lot of sucrose. Okay, Your apple has fructose because fruit fructose. Simple. Next, glucose and galactose, you get lactose and water. Lactose is your milk sugar. You get this from milk. So the reverse process is what we call hydrolysis. Why is it called hydrolysis? Because hydro being water. Lysis, like I said just now, lysis means to break or lysis is to break. I add water to break something. That's why I call it hydrolysis. Okay, really simple. So polysaccharide, these are the complex sugar. We only have three here, which is starch. You find this in plants. Cellulose, again, you find this in plant, especially plant cell wall. And of course, glycogen, you find this in all animals. Your muscle cells is now full of glycogen. Moving on, let's go to protein. 
protein is quite simple. Make sure you know how to explain the structures. That would be enough. You have your primary structure, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure. Primary structure, make sure you know how to explain them. It is a chain of amino acid bonded by peptide bonds. Our keyword here being chain of amino acid. Secondary structure means they are coiled into alpha helix shape or they are folded into beta pleated shape. Okay, coil means they are spinning around like that. Beta pleated means they are folding. Moving on, if they are going into tertiary, means they are three-dimensional shape. Okay, they have the 3D shape now. So that's the keyword for tertiary structure. Quaternary structure means they are combination of two or more tertiary chain. They are a complex of functional protein. For example, your hemoglobin is a quaternary structure. Your enzyme is a quaternary structure. Moving on, you have your lipids. So lipid, you have fats and oil, waxes, phospholipid and steroid. Okay, steroid is the hormones in your body. So fats and oil is our focus. You have saturated fats, which is the fats, and of course unsaturated fats, which is the oil. Fats, it is solid at room temperature. Think butter, right? And unsaturated fat, it is liquid at room temperature. Okay, think your sunflower oil. All right, or your cooking oil. So saturated fat is high in LDL, which is the bad cholesterol. If you eat it in a large amount, you are going to get heart disease. And if you eat sunflower oil in high, because it is high in HDL, it is much better for health. Next, saturated fat, it has no double bond. I'm sure all of you take chemistry, you know it's a double bond. So saturated fat, since they're saturated, means they have no more free space for the hydrogen to attach to, means they have no double bond. But unsaturated fat, they have at least one double bond. They, have, they can have one or two or three double bonds. And of course, saturated fat is mostly found in animals. Okay, butter comes from cows, except fish. Because you say fish oil, you don't say fish fat. And of course, unsaturated fat, it's all mostly found in plants. That's why we say sunflower oil, olive oil, besides coconut. Okay, coconut is mostly saturated fat. Okay? That's why I don't eat too much of santan. It's not very good for health. Moving on, let's go into our enzyme. There is a very important keyword for enzyme that is your lock and key hypothesis. Why is it a hypothesis? Because no one has seen this before. No one has proved this before because enzyme is really small. That's why we call it a hypothesis. Maybe someday you can prove it, you can get Nobel Prize. All right, you have your enzyme and your the thing being digested is what we call a substrate. Substrate will bind into a site called the active site okay as you can see the active site is very specific to the substrate that's why we call this a lock and key hypothesis you have only one key to open that lock that's why you can see enzyme is very specific so when they bind together you get your enzyme substrate complex after they are digested you become your enzyme and product so this enzyme can be reused again enzyme is reusable so characteristics I've already mentioned all. So they are a protein, I mentioned just now. They are a biological catalyst. I'm sure you learn catalyst in your harbor and your contact process. It means something to speed up a chemical reaction. So this being a biology catalyst, so we call it a bio, biological catalyst. They are highly specific, means they will only bind to a type of substrate. They can be reused, I mentioned that already. Can be slowed down by inhibitors. What are inhibitors? Inhibitors are a substance that has a very similar shape to a substrate, they will compete with the substrate for the active site, means they will reduce the rate of reaction. Next, moving on, this is I would say the most important part of this chapter, that will be your factors of enzyme. You have four factors here, being your pH value, your temperature, your substrate concentration, and enzyme concentration. So pH value and temperature, they almost have the same graph because they will only reach their maximum rate at their optimum level. What do I mean? Let's say for amylase, their optimum pH level is around 7, which is around neutral. So they will, be, they will work best at neutral. We call that optimum pH level. Same goes to temperature. Our body temperature is 37. So all enzymes in our body work at 37, that being the optimum temperature. So they have the same graph. As for substrate and enzyme concentration, you can see them going up and then they will level off, going up and then they will level off. Why? Because each of them, they are limiting each other. Okay, think of it very straightforward. 
Enzyme is like the bank counters. What do I mean? If you go to a bank, you can see many bank counters, isn't it? Substrate is like the customers. If you increase the number of counters in a bank, of course you're going to make the process faster. But if you increase your counters so many, if there's only 10 customers, but you have 20 counters, it's not going to make the process much faster because the customer, which is the substrate concentration, is the limiting factor. All right, please notice limiting factor. That's the keyword. And if on the other way around, if you have 10 counters, if you keep increasing the customers to 20, the number of counters is now limited. Now the enzyme concentration is the limiting factor. So the more you increase your customer, which is a substrate, it's not going to help much. That's why you can see substrate concentration and enzyme concentration, they will limit each other. Moving on, let's go into cell division. I would say this is the most important chapter. All right, being your mitosis and your meiosis. So what is the function of mitosis? Think of it this way. Mitosis is to photostat a cell. What's the function of photostat? Photostat is to create the exact same cell. So same thing here. Mitosis is to create the exact same cell. So takes place in somatic cell. What is somatic cell? Somatic cell is all the cells in your body besides your reproductive cell, your testes in guys and ovaries in girls. Function is for growth, okay, to increase the number of cells, is to replace, repair tissue. When you scratch your skin, you are going to grow your skin back to replace them. Of course, for asexual reproduction in small organisms, like your binary fission, like your budding and so on. Okay, so you have a few phases here. You have G1 phase, S phase, S phase being the synthesized phase, which means they will duplicate your chromosome. And then your G2 phase, and then your mitosis phase, and of course your cytokinesis phase. Kindly pay attention here. Mitosis is nuclear division. Means they are splitting the nucleus. Cytokinesis is cell division, which means to separate the cell. Easy way to understand this. Mitosis is to split your egg yolk. Cytokinesis is to split your egg white. I hope this makes sense. All right, so your mitosis, which is our main focus of this chapter, you have four phases here, P, M, A, T. I like to memorize it as Pasa Malam Other Telephone. You may have your own story, you may use your own way, as long as you remember, right? All right, so you have your prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and as you can see here, I only memorize one point for each phase. You might say, sir, isn't there more points for each phase? You can go and memorize all you want, but I'm keeping things simple. All right, so prophase is when your chromosome becomes visible under light microscope. You can start to see them under light microscope, huh? not electron microscope. So pay attention there. Metaphase is when you see them aligned at the equator, your katulistiwa, or I like to call it metaphase plate. Up to you, both of us are accepted. Anaphase is when your sister chromatid they separate. Telophase is when your sister chromatid they reach the opposite pole. Easy peasy, right? Only one point for each phase. Moving on. So next you have your cytokinesis. Okay, in animal cell we will form something called a cleavage furrow. It means they will pinch before they split. But in plant cells they don't do that. Plant cells they will form something called cell plates. And when these cell plates, they join together, they will form a new cell wall. So cloning. In animal cells, we call it cloning. How does this work? Basically, we take somatic cell of a donor sheep. Let's call it sheep A. And then we insert it into an egg cell, an empty egg cell. Okay, with the chromosomes removed. Uh, we use electric, of course, we zap them in. So we form an embryo, we insert it into surrogate mother. The offspring is genetically identical to the donor sheep. You should get the exact same sheep as sheep A because I'm cloning them. So this is the only cloning we have done so far. But in plants, we don't call it cloning, we call it tissue culture. So you have your explant, which means I take a small piece from a carrot, we call it explant. And when they grow into a mass of cell, we call it colors. Okay, because they are undifferentiated like your stem cell. And when they grow bigger, they become embryo, they become plundered. Plundered means a small carrot. And then when they grow up, they become an adult plant. So all these, they are keywords. Make sure you memorize them. 
Next, uncontrolled mitosis, of course you get your cancer cell. When your cancer cell develops into a mass of cancer cell, that is what we call a tumour. Simple stuff. Moving on, let's go into meiosis. So meiosis, they take place in reproductive cell. Again, that's the opposite of your somatic cell. That will be your testis and ovary. So what's the function? It's to form gametes. What is gamete again? Gamete is a sperm and ovum. Of course, this is for genetic variation. No two children will look the same. Maintain the number of chromosomes and offspring. Okay, so think of it this way. You have 46 chromosomes. Your partner will have 46 chromosomes. So next time when you want to give birth to a child, you will give 23 chromosomes and your partner will give 23 chromosomes to the child. And when you combine them, the child will have 46 chromosomes. So the process of changing 46 into 23 chromosomes, that is meiosis. Simple. So meiosis is slightly complicated because you have PMAT1 and PMAT2. That is your meiosis 1 and your meiosis 2. A quick way to memorize, PMAT2, which is your meiosis 2, is equal to mitosis. What do I mean? If you look at the explanations, they are all the same. Chromosome become visible under light microscope, align in equator, sister chromatid separate, reaches opposite pole. So if you memorize your mitosis, that will be your meiosis 2 already. Cut short. And of course, for meiosis 1, M1, A1, and T1 is also same as M2, A2, and T2. It's just that you don't use the word chromosome, you use the word homologous chromosome. As you can see here, homologous chromosome align equator, homologous chromosome separate, homologous chromosome reach the opposite pole. Very simple, isn't it? There's only one thing you need to focus in your meiosis, that would be your prophase 1. This is the most important phase that you should know because there are a few words here. Number one, homologous chromosome, they will do something called crossing over or synapsis. This is the most important keyword that you should know. So the point that they do crossing over, that is what we call chiasmata or chiasmata, whatever you want to call it. And of course, the shape, the bento they form, it's what we call tetrad and bivalent. Quick revision, the process is crossing over synapses, the place is called chiasmata, the shape is called tetrad bivalent. Moving on, so what's the difference between mitosis and meiosis? Okay, the similarities, they do DNA replication. Where do they do it? Somatic cell and reproductive cell. Do they do crossing over? No and yes. How many cell division? One and two. Daughter cells, how many? Two and four. Daughter cells chromosome, mitosis will remain diploid, means they look exactly the same. Meiosis means they are haploid, means they only have one set of chromosome. You have two, okay? But you are only going to give your child one set. Your, uh, your partner will give your child another set, so your child would have two sets. Make sense? So, compared to parent cell, it is genetically identical, exactly the same. But for meiosis, it is not identical. In fact, it is half the chromosome. Genetic variation, no and yes. Moving on into chapter 6, nutrition. This is, I would say, the most headache chapter because you are studying human, cows and rabbit. So let's go into this. Nutrition, we have two types of nutrition. You have autotroph, okay? Means making own food. Plants are autotroph. Heterotroph means we consume others. So we have another tree here. You have holozoic means we feed on other organisms. Herbivores, carnivores and omnivores. We are holozoic. Saprophytism means you eat dead stuff like mushrooms. Okay, mushroom they feed on dead trees, right? So they are saprophyt. And of course, parasitism, if you suck on the blood of someone, okay, you are a parasite. Unless you're a vampire or something. Okay, so these are like what? Mosquitoes and so on. Okay, so next, what is balanced diet? Two key points for balanced diet. You need to consume all classes of food, all seven classes, and they need to be in the correct amount. Energy content of food, we test using bomb calorie meter. What is bomb calorie meter? I'm sure you know how they look like. Okay, and then the formula for bomb calorie meter, you use 4.2 times mass of water times the increase in temperature. Actually, this is your physics formula because this is MC data. Remember your heat chapter? That's your MC data. 
Now, of course, you divide by the mass of sample and times 1000. That's how you get your energy value of food. So next, factors affecting daily energy requirement. What makes you and me have different energy requirement every day? Number one, you have your age. If you're a teenager or you're an active adult, you're gonna eat more. Sex, males eat more than females. Occupation, if you're a laborer, compared to you're an office worker, labor is going to eat more. Body size, if you are a larger individual, of course you're going to eat more because you have more body cells to feed. Climate, if you are living in a cold country, of course you're going to eat more because you are going to generate heat. Of course, pregnancy and health condition, if you are, if you are pregnant or you are sick, you are going to eat more nutritious food. So food test, I'm not going to talk too much about this because you learn this in Form 2. You have your iodine test, which is your starch, Benedict test to test glucose, Millen's test to test your protein, emulsion test to test your fats, and of course you have an extra one, we call it the BCPIP test, that is to test your vitamin C. Moving on, malnutrition is the excess or deficient of nutrient, could be too much or too little or something. For example, marasmus, quashiacal, osteoporosis, obesity, atherosclerosis, arterial sclerosis, and gout. Make sure you know what are all these, especially these two. They look very similar, but they are different things. The first one, atherosclerosis, that's the narrowing of your blood vessel. That's what causes your heart attack and stroke. Arteriosclerosis, that's the hardening of your blood vessels. So they are two different things, although they happen together. Right, so food digestion, I just wrote a summary here. Okay, you can read this yourself. This is a very long stuff to go through. Pay more attention to your protein digestion because it is like a three-step thing. Yeah, that. Okay, so you have your pepsin, trypsin, and erypsin. Okay, pepsin will break down protein into polypeptide. Trypsin will break down polypeptide into peptide, and of course, erypsin will break down your peptide into amino acid. So. That's the most complicated you need to memorize. And of course, you need to know what's the function of hydrochloric acid, that is to kill bacteria in your stomach, and what's the function of bile, okay? So bile is to emulsify fats into oil droplets. All right, so everything I already summarized here, go and memorize them all. Do I need to memorize them, sir? Yes, you do. That's why this chapter is such a hard chapter. All right, so let's look at ruminant. That will be your cow. So because this is a ruminant, so we start with rumen. Okay, ruminant, rumen. So their stomach is very easy to memorize. It's R R O A. Rumen, reticulum, omasum, abomasum. Abomasum being the true stomach. They love to ask this in an exam. Why is abomasum the true stomach? Because they secrete gastric juice, just like us. So they have protozoa in the first few stomachs. Okay, they will secrete cellulase, and this cellulase will digest cellulose, of course. And of course, they will do re rumination, which means they will puke their food out. Okay, don't say puke, say regurgitation. That's a better word. Means they will puke, they will moon ta their food back out and chew. That's why cows are always chewing something. Okay, when they are free, they will just puke something out and start chewing. Okay, I know it sounds disgusting. Okay, moving on. Rodents, okay, rats and rabbits. The food will pass through their alimentary canal twice. Means the first time they pass through, they will eat back their poop and then they'll pass it through again for absorption. Okay, because they have large sacrum and appendix, okay, this is the adaptation. Please memorize this. And in this sacrum and appendix, they have the cellulase producing bacteria similar to our cows. Okay, both of them have cellulase. We don't have cellulase, that's why we cannot digest cell wall. We cannot digest vegetable. Okay, assimilation of food, that is the sorting of food when your small intestine absorb them. So when glucose, we absorb them, and amino acid, remember these two, they will go into your blood capillary. I'm just gonna write BC here. It will go into your hepatic portal vein, and then go into your liver. Liver is the filter here. Okay, so glucose extra, they will convert it into glycogen and store it in your liver. Amino acid, if it is too many, you cannot store amino acid. They are going to convert it into urea, and then they will throw it to your kidney and you will pee it out. Right, so lipid and vitamin A, D, E, K, they will go not into your blood capillary, they will go into your lacteal, which is part of your lymphatic system. You learn this in form 5. So instead of going straight to the liver, they will go straight into your cell. That's why lipid and vitamin A, D, K, you absorb them very quickly because it doesn't go through your liver. Moving on, 
Let's go to photosynthesis. Okay, this is also the one of the most headache part. You have your light reaction and dark reaction. Okay, so what's happening at light reaction? You have your photolysis of water. Again, lysis means to break. So photolysis means I use light and I break the water into half. And then dark reaction is the reduction of carbon dioxide into glucose. Remember this reduction? Reduction means they add hydrogen. This is in a redox chapter in chemistry. Go and revise on that. And then time, of course, light reaction, they happen during daytime because you need sunlight. Dark reaction, they can happen day and night because it's not affected by light at all. Where does it take place? Light reaction will take place in the grana, which is the stack of grana. And then dark reaction will happen in the stroma, which is the liquidy stuff inside your chloroplast. Substance required light reaction, since we are breaking up water, of course we are going to need water. Dark reaction, you need carbon dioxide. And of course, what do they produce? Light reaction will produce oxygen and water, which this oxygen they will release into the air. Dark reaction, they will produce glucose and water. Alright, so make sure you know the complete reaction for photosynthesis. And the factors affecting photosynthesis will be light intensity, water, temperature, and concentration of carbon dioxide. Your light intensity and carbon concentration of carbon dioxide, it's also the same graph as your substrate concentration and enzyme concentration means they will limit each other remember what is the limiting factor i said just now okay like i said here limited by other limiting factor if my light intensity is too high it's not going to increase your photosynthesis too much because the carbon dioxide is limited now okay and the other way around chapter 7 respiration this i will say is one of the easy chapter all right so we have an aerobic respiration aerobic means with air, okay, you know you do aerobic exercises means you are breathing in air. And aerobic is when you sprint, when you run, you are you're running out of air. Okay, so that is your anaerobic respiration. So both are cellular respiration, both they break down glucose, both they will produce ATP. But well, what's the difference? Oxygen, no, and yes. Oxidation of glucose, complete, incomplete. That's why aerobic, they produce a lot of energy, okay? Complete oxidation, you get CO2, H2O, and energy. But for anaerobic respiration, you have two types here. If it happens in animals like us, we produce lactic acid. This is what makes your muscles sore. When you run marathon, you feel sore because of the lactic acid. But in yeast, yeast, they don't produce lactic acid, they will produce ethanol. This is how we make beer, or wine, or any alcoholic drinks. ATP, as you can see, aerobic, they produce 38. That's a lot of energy. But for anaerobic, there's only a very pitiful tool. That's like 19 times less energy. That's why when your body starts doing anaerobic respiration, you are going to tire soon. You are going to run out of energy soon. All right, so where does it take place? Anaerobic respiration happens in the mitochondria, but anaerobic only happens in the cytoplasm. Okay, very important point right there. So we already include both reactions for here, or I would say three reactions, okay, you can read it yourself. Next, structural adaptation of breeding mechanism, okay, basically you already learned this in form 3, which is the four adaptations of your alveolus, you know your alveolus, right? So we have four adaptations, number one, they are moist, your alveolus is moist, then they are thin, one cell thick, they have large total surface area, you have a lot of alveolus, and it is surrounded by the network of capillary. Careful not to use this point for insect because insect has no blood. I'm sure you know this. So let's look at the breathing mechanism for insect. Okay, how do they breathe in? Number one, ab abdominal muscle relax means the ab muscle they, they relax. Okay, so the volume increase, spiracles open, spiracle is the hole, and then they will the air will enter the trachea and the trachea. So this is inhalation. How about exhalation, sir? That will be the total opposite. Okay, you just need to memorize the inhalation because exhalation is the total opposite. Okay, that's what I call smart studying. So for fish, mouth opens, floor or buccal cavity lowers, which is the floor, they will lower. So operculum, which is this, they will close. Volume increase, so water will move into the mouth and then into the gills and the lamella. Lamella is the hair-like thing on the gills. So how about exhalation? Reverse. So frogs, Frog is a bit funny because exhalation and inhalation is a bit different. So inhalation is a two-step thing. They will inhale into their mouth and then into their lungs. So nostril open, glottis close. Nostril is the this 
against the nostril. Colotis is the throat, they will close. Buccal pharyngeal floor, which is the buccal floor, same as your fish, they will lower. Air will enter the mouth. And then next is to push air from the mouth into the lungs. So glottis, this throat will open. Glot, the nostril will remain closed. Okay, they'll close their nose here. Okay, the BP floor, which is the buccal pharyngeal floor, they will raise and then the air will enter the lungs. So one, two. Okay, it's a two-step thing. But when they exhale, it's very simple. So uh, lungs contract, nostril open, air exits the frog. It's a one-step thing. Okay, so frog is a bit funny. Next, humans, you learn this in Form 3, okay, for God's sake. So, external intercostal muscle contract or the internal relax, ribcage move upward and outward, diaphragm muscle contract, volume of thoracic cavity increase or the pressure decrease, air will move into the lungs. So, exhalation, as you would have guessed it, is the total opposite. Okay, moving on, how do we transport carbon dioxide? This, they will ask this in the essay, so kindly pay attention. We have three ways of transporting carbon dioxide. Number one, 7% will dissolve in blood plasma. As you can see, this is not a very efficient method. 23% will combine with your hemoglobin to form carbominohemoglobin. Again, not very efficient. 70% is carried by your bicarbonate ion. How does this work? So from your body cell to the blood, carbon dioxide will combine with water to form carbonic acid. Okay, so this is catalyzed by an enzyme known as carbonic anhydrase. So carbonic acid will dissociate into hydrogen ion. You know it's dissociate, that's in your acid chapter in chemistry. So into high H plus and your bicarbonate ion. Alright, so when it reaches the lung, so they will do the reverse. So these two will combine into carbonic acid and then it will break down into carbon dioxide and water. Simple stuff. Next, chapter 8, dynamic ecosystem. You have abiotic factors here and you have biotic factors here. I'm sure you know what is producer, consumers and decomposers, right? So if you don't, let's look at these here. You have producer, primary consumer, secondary consumer, tertiary consumer. Okay, as you can see the pyramid of numbers, they will decrease in number as they go up. This is the balance of nature. You have the least tertiary consumer because they are the strongest. You cannot have many strong predators around because you will screw up the whole food chain or the food web. So only 10% of energy is passed on to the next trophic level. So every level is called trophic level. I only pass 10% to the next level. All right, so energy is used for growth, excretion and movement. Okay, so the other 90%, they all went to here. The other 10 will pass on to the next level. So interaction between organisms, you learn this in form two like so many times. You have saprophytism means eating dead stuff. Symbiosis, you have three, commercialism, mutualism, parasitism. Competition means, okay, two strong guys fighting for something. Prey predator, a strong guy eating a weak guy. Okay, so what is commercialism? That is a remoral fish and a shark. One gets advantage, one has not, one is not affected. Okay, mutualism, both get advantages, like your sea animal and your hermit crab. Okay, sea animal gets free transport, your hermit crab gets protection. Parasitism, one gets advantage, one loses something. Like example, your flea, your kutu, or your rafflesia plant. So only memorize one example. If you want, you can memorize two examples for each symbiosis. That will be enough. Moving on. Okay, you have your pioneer species and your colonization and succession. So the first species is what we call your pioneer species. Pioneer being the first guy. So colonization and then you have another guy come and colonize, you call it succession and then when you have no more new succession, we call it a climax community. This is like our rainforest, okay? So pay particular attention to your mangrove swamp, okay? So you have your pioneer species, we call it Avicenia and Sonoratia, okay? And then you have the next succession, we call it Rhizophora and then the next succession again, we call it Bulgara. So the quick way to memorize this is A, S, R, B. So make sure you know which area they are at. This question is very common in objective. Three marks for you here. So make sure you know where are they. Okay, so muddy bank, no plants here. Okay, Avicenia is here. Sonoratia is here. Rhizophora is here and Bulgara is here. Okay, as you can see, A, S, R, B. Simple stuff. Moving on, so adaptation of mangrove plants. How do mangrove plants survive in the muddy area? Number one, they have cable roots like Avicenia or prop roots for support. What is cable root and prop roots? You can refer up here. Alright, 
and then they have pneumatophores means breeding roots okay roots to obtain oxygen thick cuticles on leaves they have very thick wax layer on leaves this is to reduce transpiration reduce water loss hypotonic cell sap so that they can absorb very salty water from surrounding and of course vv parasitly seedling means they will germinate their seed before dropping them into the ground so that they can grow into a tree much faster to increase the chance of survival moving on you have your five kingdoms monera protista fungi plantae and anemilia okay simple stuff and how do you classify all organisms you use kingdom phylum class order family genus species quick way to memorize King Philip comes over for good soup. Imagine King Philip, he comes to your house for a bowl of good soup. Okay, so King, Kingdom, Philip, Philem comes class over order for family, G, genus, and soup species. Easy way, right? And of course, five classes of microorganism bacteria, algae, fungi, protozoa, and virus. And of course, there are factors, four factors, nutrient, pH, temperature, and light intensity. This is a bit of a common sense stuff. Okay, pay more attention to your nitrogen cycle, especially these three or microorganisms. I already highlighted for you here, your rhizobium sp, and your nitrosomonas, and your nitrobacter. Okay, quick way to memorize your nitrogen cycle. You have a big cycle here, at the surrounding here and you have a small cycle at the middle. So what does it mean by small cycle? Small cycle is the exchange of plants, animals, and when they die. Okay, so they will go into ammonia, nitrification to turn to nitrite, nitrification again to turn into nitrate, and then they will absorb by the plant. So can you see this is a small cycle? Okay, and then what's the large cycle? The big cycle is when I turn nitrate into the nitrogen in the air, and then three ways of turning nitrogen in the air back into the soil. So remember these three ways, I would say this tree is the most important one. Okay, first being your legume plant, which is a peanut. Second being lightning. Third being fertilizer. So of course, fertilizer is artificial way. All right, pay more attention to nitrogen cycle because they will ask this in the essay again. Moving on, endangered ecosystem. I'm not gonna to talk too much about this because we already learned this in geography plenty of times. Okay, so air pollution. When you have sulfur, ox sulfur dioxide and nitrogen dioxide, you will form sulfuric and nitric acid, which will form acid rain. So what's the effect? Corrode building, kill aquatic animals, reduce soil fertility. CO2, it is a greenhouse gas, cause greenhouse effect, cause global warming. Remember, greenhouse effect will cause global warming. So they are the two same thing basic basically. So they will cause flood, drought, climate change, haze, dust, smoke, they are dust, they will cause respiratory diseases, reduce visibility, reduce crop yield because they are blocking sunlight course they form smog. Smog is like the hazy area in cities. Moving on, water pollution, I want you to pay very close attention to this thing called eutrophication. What is this? Basically, it's the washing of nitrate and phosphate into ponds and then you have something called algae bloom. They grow a thick layer of algae on the top of the pond. So when the algae die, they will be decomposed by dead algae. So the, the decomposer will use up all the oxygen in the water when oxygen is used up, all the aquatic plants and animals will die. So when, since they are using oxygen, it will increase something what we call BOD, which is the biological oxygen demand. Demand means I'm using all the oxygen. When I have higher BOD, means I have less oxygen in the pond. So they go, they go opposite. All right, so of course you cause death of aquatic life. Okay, moving on. You have your thinning of ozone layer, okay? So this is a very tricky stuff, a bit related to your chemistry. So you have something called CFC. When UV shine onto them, they will break a free chlorine atom. And a free chlorine atom will go and corrode this ozone, which will combine with ozone to form chlorine and oxygen. This O2 doesn't block UV anymore, so you have no more ozone. And then when a free oxygen atom comes, they will take away this oxygen, and then this free chlorine atom is free to go and attack another ozone which is this again so this process will keep repeating and repeating and repeating until your ozone layer runs out okay so remember where do you get cfc your aerosol spray your refrigerant all right so in fact you get skin cancer cataract and damaged chlorophyll okay such a long video i hope this video is helpful in helping you revise your form for I know some of the stuffs are not included in this summary notes, but I would say 80% is covered. And if you get this 80% down, 
it is more than enough for you to score an A. So make sure you stay tuned for the next part, which is our Form 5 part, which will be released soon before your biology paper. Again, quick reminder, if you need this PDF, kindly go to the links in the description and download it. It is absolutely free. If you like this video, make sure to like this video, subscribe, and I will see you again in the next video. Take care and 